Hi, you're watching Piano Mania. My name is Slava, and in this third episode, I'm delighted to have Richard Egger and Alex Nipomnyasha as my guests. They are also known as Duo Playel, but are both well established as solo artists and chamber musicians in the scene for many years. Richard is a multi instrumentalist and conductor, uh, studying organ, harpsichord, and piano and is active in a wide range from early to modern music performing all over the world. Alex studied classical piano in Moscow and later switched to historical instruments and obtained her master's degree in harpsichord and forte piano in Amsterdam. Currently, they are working on a wonderful project called Minimize to the Max, which is recording all Beethoven symphonies arranged by Carl Czerny on historical instruments. If you like this content please remember to like subscribe and share this video with your friends thank you so much for watching and enjoy this conversation with richard and alex so let's start off with the first question richard how's your russian awful no well i i've i've absorbed a bit over the last five six years um with the kids but i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say i could ever string a proper sentence together but um, no, I, 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 it's, it's not a totally Geheimatal secret language at the yeah. moment. But, but. I mean, in music, it's quite an important language, actually, I guess, besides the usual Western English and maybe some German. But Yeah, no, I, it, would be, it would be very nice to... to uh, I, but one of my favorite pieces, well, there's lots of favorite pieces, but one of my favorite pieces of choral music is the Rachmaninoff. Vespers, which I would love to conduct, and I'd love to do it in Russian. Well, maybe one day it'll happen, but uh, yeah, at least I've got a good good Russian language coach now. So, <laughs> I, I have to be honest. I mean, I grew up speaking Russian at my home, and I never officially learned it in school. But I still have trouble understanding when it's sung, like Russian lyrics. It's quite difficult. I find it. And I actually, I find it in general difficult in any opera or like classical music. <laughs> well, this leads us on to sort of musical things. I think that might be a modern performance because if you listen to old old singers in any language from pre, let's say, pre 1930s, their use of language is so much clearer. I mean, Shalyapin, you, it's the clearest kind of singing you've ever heard. And it's the same with other other singers from from those generations and even choirs though the 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 idea of what constituted clear diction and stagecraft has changed enormously and, and everybody's become very lazy about pronunciation over the last decade uh, sorry the last century i'm curious about how you met and if you met through music if it was uh you know you were you already working on a project uh, how that came about and also um, going back further to actually how you uh, came in touch with music, like obviously you have quite a substantial both of your careers and you've done many different things and not only uh, historical instruments but also modern music and it's quite a broad um, range of the musical experience and like you've not only piano, organ, you've, you're conducting and like, you're doing so many things. Um, is it just because during your life you found that doing just one thing is not meant for you? Or is it, it just happened naturally in that sense that you started different endeavors uh, in your musical career? Or was it that you always had this idea that you wanted to do many different things? I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll, uh, yes, I mean, that's absolutely right. For me, I've been obsessed with music since I can remember. I mean, my, neither of my parents were musicians. They were, my father loved music. Amateur operatics was his thing. He used to do South Pacific and all the great shows. In a strict amateur way, but he always was loved doing music on stage. But he worked at the railways. He was a railwayman. Uh, and I remember him performing in South Pacific as Billis. Uh, so he's always loved music. And, and the, the music they used to listen to at home which I became obsessed with immediately. It was all record, records, vinyl, and 78s of the great crooners from the 50s. So I, I devoured Perry Como and uh, Nat King Cole. That, that, was, that was the music that I, I, they had a limited number of it, but I used to look at the records, 
study the labels and constantly listening to that kind of music. And I didn't really come into contact with classical music till I started the piano, and I insisted that I started the piano. Because you were a, qu a choir boy at That, first, that right? came later, but I, I, when I went started at school when I was five and a half, I guess, somebody was playing the piano. Because every morning we had an assembly, and there was a lady that we sang a hymn or something at the beginning of the day, and was like, I want to play that. So the, there was somebody teaching piano in the little village outside the city where we lived, and the and then I just started playing. I always, I always wonder where that kind of um, like magic comes from. Since you didn't come from a musical family per se, like that, your your they they didn't play any instruments. But maybe they, your grandparents did. Like, is it something in inherited, or is it something that is just you know by coincidence? It's it's always an interesting philosophical question. I think for me, it just ca it came from absolutely from within because it was i was really from the the earliest point so when i was apparently when i was like one and a half two i would sit on the ground in front of the the record player the radio thing and draw notes because i'd seen the notes on the old columbia label uh, yeah. i had no idea what that I'd, I, so i was i it's and my, my grandfather actually had bought a piano for my father when my dad was like seven or something we actually have it in our house, we have it. It's a, it's a Challen upright from 1937. Lovely piano, Alex. Alex, I really, I really love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, 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 but but yeah. my father never played it, and my granddad must have messed around on it a little bit. But no, there's not. It it was really it's really interesting. It gets some somewhere where me and my other grandparents and there was no music. So maybe somewhere back in the generations, but it's certainly not. I mean, most of them were fishermen or dike builders. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, it was pretty regular jobs for that time, uh, so I guess, yeah. So, but, I mean, uh, Alex's family was, there was always music in your family, wasn't Yes, it? yeah, so the way how I did start, it was very natural because my big sister, who is two and a half years older than me, she started to play piano when she was five, which means from my two and a half, I was surrounded by music. Yeah. And also my father had always had and has still a huge love and admiration for music and uh, he, when he was a student, uh, he did a university with a mathematic, and then he kind of had a strong idea that this is not enough for him. He really loved music, and he went to study music, and he went for the choir conducting education, and ended up as a professional mm -hmm. choir con uh, choir conductor in the church. Mm -hmm. You don't see that often. Mathematics and music. <laughs> but he <laughs> really he, he had he has a brilliant brain for the mathematic. Yeah. But he thought it's it's boring for him. It's not enough. And the whole life he was really exploring the music. He, I, well, since I remember, he would always play piano and sing alone. Well, did you you had three pianos in your house? Well, some, yeah, <laughs> at some point we had three cabinet pianos in our flat, which is so what is it, sixty five square Moscow, meters? Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a quite a small flat, just a regular. Uh, maybe 60, 65 square meters flat, and in each room we had a piano. So we basically had to leave and sleep underneath the piano. <laughs> you were like a, a little music school over there. <laughs> in the building. Indeed, because my big sister, she played the piano and that was it. Great. Built. Um, was she at the Gnesin as well? Did she she get... was at the same school. So we, we all went to the same school with the Gnesin Special Music School, starting with her and then I went there and my brother tried yeah. but didn't succeed so much because he was it was difficult for him to be surrounded by, by the girls so you have what one sister one brother i have two, two sisters two sister. and yes. one brother yeah. yes big family yeah yes and we the, the special thing that we all went through one teacher in the school wow. so basically i was with one teacher from five till 18 with one piano teacher well, I, I, I had a similar experience with Mila Boslavska. I said, like, she was my actually the only teacher I had apart from the master classes that occasionally happened. But I, I can relate to this experience. I think in, uh, it, I, I don't know if I may say so, but uh, Russian, like, culture and music, and usually it's more like you become like a family setting. Like, the, the teacher becomes kind of a, a third parent in a sense, you know, and... This this is quite amazing to see, and I mean maybe because I I haven't seen the other um, cultures or other I didn't have another experience. Maybe it's similar in other but cultures. I, I think it's also related how the school 
the structure of the schools of the special music schools because we don't have it here for example in Holland and then in Moscow you can go I went when I was five to this school the preschool and then when you're around seven you play the entrance exam and then you're there and unless you decide that you don't want to do it anymore and then you switch the school because otherwise you get all the subjects there so and afterwards you went to the state conservatory yes and how was this experience well I, I it's it's a tricky one because the school as much as I loved being there in the Guinness music school uh, it was a difficult experience and um, I think in a way when I went to study harpsichord which was already in the end of my school years uh, I kind of had a little escape from being so much pressured by the yeah. um, pressed by the system at school yeah so then I went I went to study harpsichord and I still did of course piano so I finished the school as a pianist and a harpsichordist already but it was really clear for me that I really would like to go that road uh, towards the historical performance because there I could feel much more freedom, which I never experienced before. From what age was that that you like well, I, kind I, of knew that I you started to play harpsichord when I was seventeen, so it was quite, so late. quite late. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I actually lots of music, most of the music I never heard before. And there was really lots of new things came immediately to me. And that was a great experience. And then to the concerto, I already went to the historical and uh, modern. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how is actually that feeling of playing such old, old music and modern music? It's like this quite contrasting, but in a sense, I guess, in there is also in the technique sense, there will be is there are there with the harpsichord i kind of had to really go completely different road and that in the beginning it felt slightly weird because you sort of facing the so many simple things which you thought it was simple before like you you basically get to play inventions by buff which you played years years ago and that felt slightly awkward in the beginning but then the more you get into that that i felt really really close with the instrument. I really love the sound. I really love the touch and just spending time on it. And also the variety of the instruments, because this was also quite new for me. I just, since I started to work with Mana, I discovered all these amazing instruments in the Rausleide. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> mind is blown, yeah. you know, it's like from it's the like, first uh, it's Steinway. The, it's, it's the best candy shop in right, the world. Right. It's I just I like a kid at a candy store. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but I've, I, from the first Steinway model to like all these, the whole, like the whole history around it. And it's, it's just amazing to see the development of this instrument. And I'm very curious how this will continue further. Like we have the Spirio system, which is like the most modern technological advancement, I guess. And then you have the um, Aurus, like the um, the system with the speakers within the grand. Then you have the you have streaming, like you can play somewhere in the world, and then everywhere in the world, people can log in and they can enjoy your performance in the room. I'm curious, what is the what is going to be a further development of the instrument? Do you have any like ideas or thoughts about this? Well, in terms of technical development of the instrument, I think what what Chris is uh, the the, the, the Myrna, um brand is doing with with the straight strong and and the radio. I mean the, the Vignoli, yeah. I think that's fantastic. I mean it's really unique, uh, and, and as you can see, everybody is responding to it right up to the top 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 level um so i think from that point of view i think the the, the piano is in great hands the, the piano as we see it as a physical machine musical instrument um but i do think this i, I mean we've we've seen this spirio thing in action and i think that's really incredibly cool um and one of the things that we're, we're looking at doing we're um, going to record a christmas cd next spring um, and what would be really cool is if we can put that repertoire on yeah. the Spirio system so people can, if they want a Christmas performance of, from us doing the full... Uh -huh. Yeah, we, we've, we've got a nice nice um, program of Christmas stuff. So, I'm, uh, But I think the Spirio, it's, it's really spooky. It's really, really spooky. It's like, it's like the, you know, the self... 
<coughs> self-driving Tesla. If you, I don't know if you've ever ever it, done that. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, but it, I've seen it. It's really spooky that, that this car can drive itself basically, and it's the same thing with the with the Spirit. I think it's amazing, and and also when the way when it can create performances by old pianists as well. I mean, that's. I mean, they 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 took the audio file and then they translated it into the Spirit or like a MIDI. Now it's going to be MIDI two point So there's like. 1024 levels of sensitivity so in in theory it plays even better i yeah. mean more accurate than i've only got six persons, you know? <laughs> so um but but with those historical recordings what they did is essentially they just you know translated into this other other format first and then uh into um yeah the, the actual performance but it's crazy to think that actually for a moment, you're kind of going back in time and you're imagining this person playing in front of you and it had, it had sounded like this. I mean, that's, uh, that's I mean, we've, of course, we've had piano rolls. Piano rolls have been around since the beginning of the 20th century. Yes. Um, but often when I've heard them reproduced, they haven't been reproduced very well because I've, I've certainly, certainly if you buy CDs of piano roll reproductions, they're often played back on you know, concert grounds from the late 1990s or so they're not they're not played back on instruments that they were recorded on which okay. is which yeah, is immediately already a diff a difference there's yeah. already a difference but but the spirit system seems to to have addressed some of that the, i mean the the, the quality that the, the, it provides Precision when you when you, when you hear these playbacks from from Corto or whoever it is um you know they Mara Hess or it is extraordinary it really is and, and interesting also to think about possibilities like you can record one part or several parts and then play together at the same time like you can even make a eight hand version having only one person yeah. or two people and then perform this live even to an audience in this sense i think that's a really it's a really exciting thing so we, we obviously we only seen it once i do not see oh, I, I saw it when i was in rouselade actually and uh it's really it's really cool and and yeah, i think it's a really it's a really great way to be able to reach people with a with a real instrument in their living room. Um, what about actually, I mean, now we're making a tangent onto your current project, uh, Minimize to the Max, right? Yeah. Uh, why won't you want to record it for Spirio as well? Because I know you're doing it on historical instruments, correct? Uh, maybe, maybe maybe, we could. I mean, we, I say it's, it's something that's very fresh in our minds, this, this idea of doing stuff with Spirio, but certainly. But I mean, the point of uh, uh, this series, which is... Um, we're recording all of the Beethoven symphonies in transcriptions by Beethoven student Carl Czerny. And that, of course, well, Czerny is, a, is not necessarily a name that people love and um, uh, unfortunately, respect, unfortunately, but, yes. but actually he it's is... misunderstood, yeah. He is completely misunderstood. He, of course, he studied with Beethoven at the age of nine, yeah. uh, uh, well, 10, sorry. He, gave his, he performed Mozart's Minor Piano Concerto when he was nine in Vienna. And of course, Beethoven entrusted the performance of the Emperor Concerto to him. But he heard all of this music coming out of Beethoven's pen, uh, and the arrangements. It was this was something that sort of we we came together with. I mean, I, I'd started getting interested in exploring forehand repertoire, and I came across these Czerny Beethoven symphonies, and the arrangements are absolutely stupendous. They, I mean, everybody that has heard them has been completely blown away by them. I remember when you performed here, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, and there, there's magnificent arrangements done with great love and attention and care. And we know that Beethoven actually um, proofread some of Czerny's arrangements but as they were coming, as Czerny was making them. Uh, so Beethoven was obviously aware of them and, and, and happy about them. Um, so that's a, a three-year project and we've recorded number three and number six, the Eroic and the Pastoral. And the rest will be out by the beginning of Beethoven year 2027. Yeah. For the centenary. So we'll have it all in the can. And uh, we've got lots of uh, ideas about how to promote that. And, uh, but, but it's a, and it's fantastic that, again, that we can uh, use the collection, Chris's collection. Uh, we, the, for the third and the sixth, we used this amazing era from, from 1836. 1836, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just spectacular. I mean, we were originally going to, we have a play L from 1848, which is where we get our name from. The Adria play L. It's a fantastic instrument. And we originally thought to do three, five, and six on our play L. But when we went to Rouslader, whenever it was last year, um, we played this uh, error. We thought we have to use this because the sound of the piano, it was so 
colourful and orchestral and, and huge compared to a, a, a Viennese piano from exactly the same year. And and Chris Chris also has an 1836 um, graph in his collection. And you put them next to each other and you think, it's like, you know, a, a Fiat Uno against yeah. a, 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 a... Maserati. A Maserati. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... But so you can see that it, it also points out the different countries' piano technique yeah. building and, yeah. and it's fascinating. I noticed this as well. It's so um, it's, it's, as I say, it's like being having a candy store. So we're, um, for, for the next recording, we're using our play alpha numbers five and eight. And then one and two we'll do on this graph from 1836. So we have um, a, a number of different uh, instruments to, to record on. And it's, I think it's really important to deliver these transcriptions on these incredible instruments from the time that Czerny was around. And but Beethoven, no, but he obviously didn't know he was dead by 1830s, but uh, he would have, um, and the, the arrangements were made from the second decade of the 19th century. So, uh, yeah, it's great to have these toys to play with. Yeah, so coming back, actually, still unanswered question, how did you meet? And and uh, when does this project came about, Duo Playo? The first time I met you was in Masterclass, I think, wasn't it? Yes, yes. 2010. Ten. Masterclass in Konsergibau, in the Kleinethal yeah. Konsergibau. What kind of, uh, what was it about? It was just a masterclass where Richard gave a harpsichord for, I think it was three students were chosen or something. We had to send some recordings. Well, you could, we could choose the repertoire. And the, the very funny thing that I chose, the, the composer who Richard really disliked. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, have so I didn't know him. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I never met him before. So because Richard was in Moscow, uh, yeah. it was quite, I don't know which year was it. And he came for, he came for them. Master, was it master class or was it just a concert? Oh, but at that time, I was not yet in the harpsichord class, so I was not exactly around. I remember the the little poster on the door yeah. in the, of the harpsichord room in the conservatory uh, with your name, but I, yeah, I was not there. And uh, so then the, that was a master class when we met. And then I played Carl Philipp Emmanuel Bach Sonata. And the first thing which Richard told me, I, you have to smile, Walt. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of his first comments. <laughs> I mean, now, now that you mention it, I remember how you two performed, and I was so, and we spoke even about this, like, it's the, the, the music scene is too serious in general. Like, you, you have such a wonderful, charismatic, uh, you know, way about you and you make people feel at ease and you are so at ease on stage. It's just wonderful to see. It's just, you don't see this often, you know, so everybody's like, come on stage and, 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 and go away, you know? Yeah, well, that's it. how we train, you know, I, yeah. I never heard like come and smile until I go to the <laughs> harpsichord. That's when, when I started to have master classes. The first master class was opposing for me. I met with Trevor Pinnock. Who had great influence because it was just an hour masterclass on some birds, feeling bird. Yeah. And I was really amazed by his energy, spirit, positive comments and feeling. And then like, he also said to me, like, yeah. smile, you know, you have fun. And I never heard it during my piano years. Me Incredible. Neither. Me neither. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's not to say that, that music isn't a serious business and the delivery of music and understanding music it's of course you have to get deep in but the 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 act of performing music has become in the in the 20th century this sort of religious holy experience where you're not allowed to interact and not allowed to make noise and it's just it's just not it's not right it's not it, that and that happened in the 20th century not before uh it's just a, it's, and it's something that, that I, I've always felt is, it, particularly with music which is unfamiliar, and a lot of the stuff that we do in the early music world, if you're coming to an audience in, in a small town in Germany or a, a small town in America or where it is, and they've got a music club and you go and they, they might have heard a bit of early music. If you're playing Schmelzer or Bieber or even William Byrd, they might never have heard any of this music before. Justin Bieber, maybe. And maybe, yeah. <laughs> so you can't just sit down and expect them to get it without a bit of help and breaking the fourth wall and engaging and, and, and encouraging and, and giving permission for them to engage with what you're doing as well. It's a two-way thing, and that's what music making was until the 20th century. 
in the classical world at least. And that interaction and that idea of spontaneity and connection and reaction went into pop and jazz. That's where that's where it went. Most of it. And still is. Well, still you know, is. Yeah. Um, so that's just to try and bring a bring back a bit of that that um, way of thinking. Is real. It's always always been very important for me since my university days. So. So, um, some years after you formed the duo, and um, you've already recorded some Schubert, right? Yeah, and we've, we've done three CDs of discs. Yes. Schubert was so we we recorded two of them together: the Schubert disc, which has the the great fantasy and and other stuff. Rondos, uh, and then we did a, a disc of the complete Dussek. Oh yes, that, four hand stuff. Yeah. Those were both on our Play L, yeah. and the last one, which came out November twenty two, was a disc of J C Bach and Mozart sonatas for four hands. Wonderful, and, and all, and all old, older instruments. So. That, that that was on our five octave copy of our five octave instrument uh, made by Heis Wilderom, who I, I think you met at the. The concert here. Um, he has only made one copy of a five octave, and we have it. And I must say, it's just one of the one of the really great copies of an old instrument. Like like Chris is, you know, he's he's very dedicated to getting stuff right. And and uh, but it was the only one he's ever made, so we're very very lucky to have it. It's, it's incredible to have a unique Opus unique. Unicum. Yeah. Opus unicum, yeah. Yeah. When when did you start? You know, doing a project together. Do play all started in? Well, no, we first started at just without the names, yes. just with our own names. So we started to play together. I think the first public thing we played in 2015. So just just after we were married, I think, yeah. at, a, at a birthday party. And, yeah, and we played Dussek. So yeah. that's for sure we did. With some other pieces, I'm sure we also performed. But Dussek, what I remember. Because oh, I was I'm a, I was a bit of a Dussek nut when I was teaching Alex at the Conservatory forty piano. I taught forty piano at the Amsterdam yeah, Conservatory. Two thousand two thousand twelve was it was one of the big anniversaries, which nobody of course did anything about because nobody was interested in Dussek. So I made everybody play Dussek that year, and and Alex played one of the big uh, four hand sonatas of Dussek with an, another actually another one one of those tunes that played in that masterclass in two thousand ten. Um, so I knew of the stuff, and so we played played. Um, the Dussek Big C Major Sonata at a birthday party. And, and the following year, in 2016, we played another concert, and uh, there was, was some Schubert, and I think, I guess, Dussek as well. And, yeah. and I think after that, when we decided to, I don't know when, when did we, what, it just when came. did we call this one? No, I think it was an A, yeah. we came just before the CD. Probably. Before the, we, we made a CD recording. But it was certainly a repertoire which, I mean, I I played a bit of. I don't know how much forehands you'd done. But I haven't done much. I played maybe once with my sister, <laughs> but it never kind of did fit. Interesting. Did it you, was did hard. You that that I, I, even another question popped up while you were saying that everyone in your family was going through the same school and teacher. Even like, I'm curious if the teacher saw any similarities between you and your brothers and sisters, or the, or you were still very different musically wise. I think there there are lots of similarities indeed the way how how we being trained as well because my our father he did quite lots of inputs yeah. all of us yeah. especially in my big and in me such yeah. and the way it was it was a very tough lessons with him but it's uh, lots of good things I don't like the way he would always require us to to hear things to encourage the ears which. Yes. Your training is it everything would, in a sense. Yeah, and, and to hear things, he couldn't explain well what he really would like to hear. But when it was wrong, he was just, no, no, you need to listen better, you need to get better. And that was like, we could sit for three hours on one bar. Yeah. My mouth would get crazy. <laughs> yeah, but you, you hear it more often with the Russian uh, teachings. That it's, it goes so, so exact and so, you know, getting things in the right way, but what is the right what way? Is the, says, well, you know? I had a different teacher. So at school, my school teacher was quite a relaxed one. So comparable to the other teachers, she would never scream. She was quite an early bird. So I had, I used to have lessons at eight in the morning. Yes. In the hall of the school, nation school, because it was always free, of course. And then she would sit on the last row of the, the hall and she was like, oh, can you do more right hand? Because the Yamaha didn't pr produce enough sound in the, in the top press. That's a great way to 
uh, train in the concert. Obviously. obviously, it will change drastically when there's people inside with the reverb time, but only we don't really. I, from what I remember, usually you had the lesson in class, and yeah, you had some, uh, you know, force, uh, how do you force, yeah, force yeah. Valve, but what's it? What is, yeah, but like, yes, you, you were. I, I was told, like, yeah, you need to project and this and that, but how it's very hard to imagine yourself while you're playing on stage in the back seat, you know, in the back row, to have like this kind of feedback to yourself and how well the balances of your playing. It's very, incredibly hard, but if you do this all the time... Yeah, that's really a really good I point. don't know if back then you already had a chance to record yourself. You, no, you no, no, that? not really, no. No, no, no. We didn't have it. We, our family didn't have video or audio equipment, so we didn't record. Uh, I think my final exam at the school was recorded on the video. Yeah. I've seen it. You have seen it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cesar Frank. The Cesar Frank was there, now it's... The that, that was your... Uh, is I it mean, I was eighteen. Or oh, I was, no, 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 no. It was when I uh, the finished the Ghanaian yes, school when exactly. I was eighteen before yeah. going to the concert. Okay. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Yes. But so that was quite an experience at eight in the morning. I'm not the early morning person. Yeah. And she was, and that she was really completely awake and expecting me, you know, just to to, to do as bright as she would imagine. But I was just half asleep. I, what what was your favorite repertoire up until you? I mean, maybe they're still. But what is your favorite composers of the uh, piano repertoire? Well, I always enjoy playing Bach. I must say so. And uh, Schubert was also another composer who I really loved. For yes, could you could you elaborate a bit more? What really draw you to this music? Like personally, just your emotional connection or what, whatever it was. I'm curious. But I think it's it's just the way how. I could hear it really well. I could understand the music, and it didn't require so much physical yeah. involvement, and it was more with kind of yeah, ear, like the brain work. Well, I don't know. I don't have much, no, no, okay. but I had a good intuition thing for the polyphony, yeah. and I really enjoyed oh, looking cool. and playing it, and and because we also had a great theory lessons at school and I had it because I had it sort of in once uh, lessons with, yeah. a, with a great teacher and we had a polyphony as well so we had to write three voices Richard Carson and then old style and then in Baroque style so I was really really in, in love with all, all of that stuff this all the theoretical subjects as well so probably that really made me love this polyph polyphony style but I wish Schubert I think it's just my soul I yeah. love the songs I love the all the piano repertoire I love listening I think that's a, I think the Russians have always been great great fans of Schubert I mean you, you think of the, you know, Richter and all these people that were really very very deeply into and Bach even as and Bach well. as well yeah. yes I it's, mean uh, apart from the Russian composers like it's like it seems that there's, I don't know if, there, if this is a thing like I heard or read somewhere in the Moscow Conservatory, a lot of Tchaikovsky was played or trained in the in the When you're teachings. young, yes. When you're yeah. young, you do play like this uh, children's album yeah. and then you play yeah. the sizzle, yeah. of course. Yeah. That's I did quite a lot. I, I, I love that, actually. That's one of my favorite pieces from Tchaikovsky. It's, it's a wonderful composition and in its whole. It's wonderful. When I was young, I just enjoyed music. It, whatever it would be when I would hear it my sister would practice Mozart or Chopin I really loved it it's just like the, the music really got me it, it touched me and yeah and that's uh, I loved all first well, no. I have to find you that book yes that was one of the favorite books the hundred operas I don't know, I don't know if, you, if you had it maybe it came across as a pink book pink book, pink book with the, yeah it says hundred operas and it the, it's, it says all about the like his, uh, I'll, history, I'll how it in the video. I think it's but I, I, either about how it was the history of uh, composition when it was premiered and all these things, and also the story of the opera itself. Which oh. and you used to read it in every room of the house of the flat. Uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, I used to. Yeah, I used to take scores to the, the smallest room in in the building, yeah. and, and I used to read them while relaxing yes. in the in the smallest room. <laughs> 
um, I used to re- re- I used to take Bartok concerto for orchestra in the Rite of Spring. My book was the that was the hundred operas. This just I like that. <laughs> I really love operas much more than ballet. And what about you, Richard? So your favorite and composers up until you, I mean, your switch to all instruments did you played piano first or was it always from the beginning you played already all no i played i played piano and first. organ I, as well you I, i started because i went to a, I, because of my um choir boy thing which i i went to the choir when i was nine in york a big cathedral and of course well a bit like the sort of the training that you experienced in in moscow Being in an English cathedral choir, it's quite something. I mean, the, the training is extraordinary. You know, as you can be as young as seven or eight when you start in the choir. And at York, we sang nine services a week. Wow. Nine during the week. And we would always have a new piece every service during the year. So you were constantly learning and singing and listening to, That's to wonderful. music. And we had a rehearsal, like a half an hour, 45 minutes rehearsal before school at 7.30 or quarter to eight or something. And then a rehearsal before the service. So there was a service every day except Wednesdays and three services on Sunday. Yeah. So it was an incredible way of processing music and getting to hear music and feel music. And um, so, but I, so I, I got the taste for that whole cathedral thing. So as a choir boy, so I sort of knew a little bit about the organ and was sort of used that and when I went to music school uh, after I left the choir I went to a music school in Manchester where I started the organ at the age of 14 um, and I was organ scholar at Manchester during that school time and then I went to Cambridge as an organ scholar so I used that whole cathedral organ choir training through Cambridge and it was really only at Cambridge because I was an organ scholar at a chapel, a Clare College chapel, which is next door to King's. King's is the famous one. Clare's next door is much better. Um, uh, uh, um, and there was a harpsichord in the in the ante chapel in the little first bit as you went to the chapel, and I just I started playing it because I was under the organ. What age was this? Brookside? Uh, 18, 19. Yeah, so also actually about the same yeah. age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Of course, I played the organ, but I, I I'd seen a harpsichord, but I'd never really played one. And because it was there, I, and I could read figured bass, I, I, because of the whole organist training, I was very fluent at reading and score and, and transposing, and, and, and I understood figured bass. So I literally just started playing with a, a friend from the college down the road. He had a viola da gamba, and he brought facsimiles of Marin Marais gamba music. Now, the old the facsimiles of the old prince, the 17th century prince, 18th century prince and just started playing and uh, just kept on playing through university and 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 one of my great colleagues Andrew Manzi violin came the following year to the, my college and we just started playing and just doing it just as because it was interesting so what was your <laughs> favorite repertoire or your composers at that moment well I was still playing everything I was still playing modern music and uh, still playing lots of piano so I, that was just another thing and I I've always had this kind, kind of omnivorous yeah. appetite for music it, it, I don't which, which carries through to the rest yeah. of your life and, and I still endeavors. and yeah. I still do and I you know I, I very rarely listen to one type of music I start you know I listen to everything I, I've been getting into, into electronic music recently and we have a talk after this is over all here. sorts of all <laughs> sorts of things. I mean because I, I just respond if it's good music I respond to it I don't I I I've never wanted to. Yeah, but define good music. <laughs> well, that, that's that that's can taste, that uh, can thing, be a tasting, you know? but I've never I've never discounted even you know, it's like country music. I mean, there's there's fantastic country music as well, um, and I, I've always uh, and not and not all of my colleagues in the early music world are like that, and that's fine as long as they don't say this is the only way to do this. That's oh, wrong and bad. It's another way when some harpsichordists say, "Oh, you should not play piano." Yes, and that, when that yeah. is that, or, and the other way around, mm-hmm. and that is really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, keeping a, keeping an open mind in general in your life, I think, is beneficial. Not to be narrow minded or in one certain way, because maybe someone else taught you this, and they were like, "Oh, yeah, I just must copy and paste this idea," you know. I mean, I think this—the whole thing about old instruments and, and and 
music, it, it, it's it's wanting to know. It, I mean, Bernstein was was a great example of this. He was just insatiably curious about everything: music, language, literature, theatre. And I've always just been, you know, wanted to know why. You know, why why do these old pianos sound like this? What what does it have to do with? And and, and once you start investigating that music on good. On, on good old instruments, it can teach you so much about colours within the music. And then it's not that you have to play that music on that instrument. You can use that understanding and knowledge when you play it on a, on, a, on Chris Miner's pianos or whoever, or on a synthesizer. I've played Bach on the synthesizer and been very happy doing it's it. It's fantastic. Um, um, it's about wanting to know, wanting to, to learn, always to, to learn more and understand more about what's, what the music is about. And yeah, there's just so much good music around. I, I, I could never limit myself to one. I, I think it's, it's a benefit to expanding your horizons and, you know, listening to a little bit of everything instead of just being focused on one thing. I think in general, uh, being an artist or a musician or a creative person having more kind of broader horizon will be beneficial. And I think it's really important as, as a recreative artist. I mean, I don't compose. I wish I, I wish I could. I, I, I you had, never I, tried. I did try, and yeah. I've got pages of stuff at home uh, where you know, nineteen bars of an orchestra concerto for orchestra. Maybe um, you could to go into electronic music. Then composition is going to be quite different approach. You know. But it's 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 really when you start listening to jazz or good pop music and, and that spirit of spontaneity with the greatest performers in those those genres, it's it really helps you um, when you try and do that for Mozart piano concerto or whatever it is that that uh, to try and take back some of that and it's 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 scary it's dangerous you, you know if you're going to improvise a cadenza. It's scary, and that it's. But you use you when you do that, and it's something you really you have to have the tools to be able to do that. You have to understand harmony and how to string bits of music together, or come up, come up with things on the hoof, as we say in my country. Um, but and you can only really learn to do that by doing it and getting it wrong. That's what I always say. You know, you, you screw something up there, but you find. It's amazing when you're when you're doing that. Your brain works in a very different way, and you listen in a different way. And you find if you're you know if you if you can if you find a way through, and it's it's very exciting. Yeah, and it can also be special. and it can also be very embarrassing as well. Yeah, because we have played together. It's improvising a lot, and of course, it's encouraging me to do though, which I kind of haven't done. Ah, this is a, an interesting thing. Like, uh, and an usually in the conservatory study. I mean, unless you have a teacher that is actually into this, I feel like uh, in old music there is way more improvisation than in standard classical repertoire. It's like, coming. It's coming. Like my, I was never taught to improvise. Like we had a class, like improvisation class, but uh, Mina, for example, never said to me, "Yeah, you should improvise more." I even thought about studying jazz after I finished my masters in classical, but finally, I. I you know, for that time, it was not the right moment, but I always was interested in this skill of improvisation and having your ear developed much more that you can hear any harmony directly and transpose directly. Like, I feel this is really an underrated skill that is should be given more attention in, in, in conservatory studies. For the it's an official thing that, like, only in Baroque music you're allowed to add certain amount of ornaments, even though in Bach you have to be careful. But then starting from Mozart, you're kind of really much more restricted. That's, that's, that's become, it's become problem. restricted by... By, yeah. By, well, by, by 20th century ideas of what performance practice is about. The similar to that you can't clap and you can't... Exactly, you know, exa it's like exactly the same. It comes from this exactly the same mentality. Because, you know, all, all of the great pianists of the 19th century were improvisers. They all were. They all did it. You know, even Horowitz and Rachmaninoff, all these guys... That they 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 one of their favorite people to go and listen to was Art Tatum. Yeah, they all said that you know if he if he if he went into classical music we'd all be out of a job. I know this little anecdote of Horowitz meeting Art Tatum. Or I, I'm not sure if it was no I I heard it anyway the the he came to play for Art Tatum and Art Tatum gave him like scores of his 
piece or something like this. And Horowitz was practicing for three months and then he gave, uh, he played it for Artadum and then Artadum played it directly after him, like without one single mistake. And I was like, I can't believe it. This is impossible. <laughs> but it's, it's just something, again, it's something once you, once the system clamps down and, and negates that, that idea of spontaneity and that, that nurturing of, of it. And I say it's something you can only do by by doing it, really. To, 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 and that's why everybody sounds different. Every jazz pianist sounds different. There isn't a formula. It's something you, they develop as individuals and, and their licks are very personal. And you find that with Baroque keyboard players or keyboard music. So you know, when you play Bach, it feels one way. When you play Handel, it feels really different. Or Brahms and Schumann, they, they feel really, really different because they're their way of playing and composing and therefore as well it just has different physical aspects to it and and um, you know it'd be wonderful to have heard these people improvise I mean, I mean a lot of the music that Bach performed during his lifetime was was improvising wouldn't that be wonderful to you know he probably lost more than half of what Bach ever came up with it uh, because it's the way I, I think in general most of the music that was written was just the composer sitting and improvising and writing down what he liked you know from the stuff that just came out of the improvisation you know like I sit down to compose it just I think mostly it was just playing and improvising and writing down what Isha have you've been influenced by or hearing around like there's this saying that nothing is original you know we're always getting influenced or inspired by something we heard somewhere in our lifetime and that's at some point we filter it out comes through us as a as a vessel but uh it's definitely uh incredibly in but it's the same like when you record the cd so you record it a certain way but then you listen to it after two years and like well i do it completely different now like you know you, you really change really Really cool. well, that's okay. That's okay. It's fine. No, because that, so it can't be the same. So it should never sound the same. Because we evolve as people, you know, and I think it's a good thing. It means that you have your hearing has improved, or you have just you or know, just different or different different I mean, day different. Hope. True. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the role of social media on the modern day artist? It's quite a different topic here but do you feel it's needed to be successful do you think it has any negative impact on the perception of classical music or music scene because the attention span of viewers and social media has drastically lowered in the past few years like every platform even has their own audience like facebook has a specific audience and a specific age group um, instagram has a specific audience and age group YouTube, like all of these social media platforms, uh, I believe they are helping to get people also aware of music and classical music, which is a good thing um, to people that never were in touch with it, you know, and bridge the gap between them going to a concert. But in general, do, do you feel, uh, since I you have the most experience of us in the room right now and in, in music and do you feel that there is a you know what has changed since social media has arrived to this world it's a big question i mean uh i think uh, what you have touched on i think social media is a great or can be a great help to to bridge that gap with with a new audience um I mean, don't, uh, we're, we're not very uh, experienced in this. I mean, we know we're not TikTokers and we've got Facebook pages, but we don't put a lot of stuff out on. I don't have many followers um, or... Uh, but I, so I, I can't really comment on that, but I think it, it, it can be if you've got someone that can um, help you use that to, to bring in people. But I do, I do think that live concert experience is... Is what we should be aiming to to do, um, and and that again brings us back to this idea of changing the changing the idea of what a classical concert could be. I'm sure you have noticed the past 10-15 years, audiovisual has grown 
enormously. Like you almost don't see any regular, I mean, they are there for the people that know it and there, the niche is still there. And I've been to the master, it's not the master pianist now, but like some of the concerts are sold out. Some of them are less. It really depends also on many things, but, uh, like what I see, I see a tendency of a lot of concerts also having something visual to add. I did my master thesis about this many years ago. I think, you know, film music, all this is, it's, it's important and it can really enhance the experience. But, um, I feel that it's also there to help people dr be drawn into classical music or maybe, um, orchestral music, which they otherwise wouldn't be interested in. I, so I, get, I think it, I think it can it can be nice to include those aspects in the performance. I mean, especially if it's. Have you ever done something like this um, with, with, with not, multi -discipline, the disciplinary? Not not really not so much. No, I've I've only done sort of opera uh, with with that kind of element sometimes involved with with some audio audio, audio visual stuff within an opera, but not. I haven't done concerts where there's been. No, laser shows or stuff like, <laughs> stuff like that. I think that can be it can depending on what the repertoire is and what the what the point of the concert is. But if you're if you're if you're going to perform a Beethoven symphony, you shouldn't need it if it's being done if it's being delivered in the right way. And, and that's exactly what we were talking about: not having to sit down there and be quiet and not get involved. If you are, uh, and that's what I was saying about changing the idea of what a classical concert is, uh, it's can become very clear sort of post-COVID that there's a changing appetite for what people want in a concert. They don't want a two-hour concert. A lot of people want shorter concerts earlier in the day. So I'm sorry, but you no, know, concert about playing concerts at 8.15 of a Bruckner symphony, is that going to encourage kids to come to the concert? Absolutely not. Um, yeah. You know, so that's that's something that I think we should be looking at, and and you know, saying to people as they're coming to the concert, this is an interactive experience. If you want to get up, walk around, throw things, scream, do it because that's what was happening when Beethoven symphonies were being performed. Feel as though you can, and, and and giving really committed, intense performances of this music well without tricks, and that's what sometimes, and particularly early music performers playing later music particularly, or even early music, they resort to sort of musical tricks when they're performing, rather than actually performing it really well with what, what's underneath the music and what's in the music. They'll start adding stuff on top, which is not actually what's been written down by the composer. That's, that's a, big, a big subject. So I think, I, I do believe that, that live concerts are the best way to experience this stuff. But of course, you know, having stuff on on. It's, it's really useful. I mean, you know, we've, we, have, we have videos from our concerts that we've done of the Beethoven. That's really useful. We've got some really high-quality video, which is great for promotion. And, to, and yeah, basically, got, when we put things up, we kind of hope that that encourages public to come to our concerts. That's what we are aiming for, yeah, so just for that reason. Yeah. That's all you can find useful people as well who you could contact and uh, so maybe we the, maybe maybe we should have some reindeer live reindeer for our christmas concert or something <laughs> i mean it's yeah but just that's uh, being silly but, yeah. but you know but the, the idea of what what you know what is a concert for it's not it's not something to go to after you've had a long day at work and just want to go to sleep and not be in and if you want to go and hear in beethoven symphony go and hear it go and experience it just you know it, sh it should be something which is which gets you lathered up and involved rather than comatose, <laughs> sitting down and not responding to it and not being allowed to, because that's the culture, a lot of what the culture has become about classical concert. You already do it in your performance, like you start to speak with the audience, you make them at ease, but um, do you feel that the audience, uh, maybe there's some ways that can be helpful to other ways that can be helpful for, for people to prepare or to be more relaxed in that sense, like maybe write in the program or, or show a note or on a show on a screen, like you can enjoy yourself. You don't have to be uptight and you can clap between. Well, that's what I, that, that's what I do when I, when I conduct, conduct orchestral concerts. Uh, I, I, well, I'm, I, the next thing I'm doing away from home is simple chamber orchestra. I go there pretty regularly and I say that to them. 
uh, in the concert saying so, you, you, but do you feel that they actually respond yeah, to it yes yeah. absolutely they people yes yeah, so the only thing that more people should do that yeah because that's what again it's about giving permission yeah. it, it, it's, it's like when teaching you know uh, uh, I think a lot of what we do well I do certainly and Alex does with students is say you can you can try you can try arpeggiating the first chord of of Beethoven fourth piano concerto we know that he did um yeah. It's giving permission for pe to, to people to, to, to try new things, yeah. not to be afraid. I think that it um, kind of makes it into an interactive experience yeah. more for the audience. I, I'm sure, I don't know if you know uh, Jacob Collier? Of course. Yeah. One I, of I've, my... been, I've been playing lots of Italics recently, yeah, and, and, and our daughters. M Maria, our six-year-old, is fascinated by him. You've seen how the way that he interacts with the audience. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing, and he's, I, I believe he's comparable in genius to you know a, a great it's like doing something absolutely you know groundbreaking even micro i mean microtonality isn't something new but he's actually implementing it in a way that you know it's um people are enjoying it and it's uh it's just wonderful but i i really wish that more people would be doing like the, like he's doing and then people really feel that they are connected as a oh, whole. Oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, you, you know, the, every person in those audiences that he's been going around for the last decade or whatever, they're going to come away from that feeling completely invigorated and, and inspired by that, having that connection just by just by singing together with, with a bunch of a thousand people or whatever it is. You know, yeah, I mean, people do respond to it. They, they really, really do. And um, this... this um, one of the things that the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra is doing, they're, they're, they're putting the concerts early, they're, give, they're having concerts which are not necessarily with an interval, where they have a Friday morning concert at 11 now, which is packed, and packed with kids as well. Uh, it's fantastic. It's a completely different vibe in the audience. It feels very, very different. And yeah, the people really do respond to it, especially with the c contact that certainly I give them from the, from the stage. And the, the, the fact that you know, if there are kids there, if they want to want to scream and shout, fine. It's just the way it is, and it's the way it was. It's the way a classical concert concert was a classical experience of music was until the 20th century when it was clamped down. It's such a pity. So that's not what music should be about. If you could give advice to your younger self or uh, a younger person that is starting this musical journey, um, what would that be, and what are the things that you would have done done differently? That Well, for me, it would be like definitely. I would say like stop being afraid there to do things and just do it. Try try new things. Definitely, and like improvising in more. Playing, or... improvising more. Oh, playing mm. different <laughs> repertoire. Maybe going into not only into classical music, which I didn't have at all that experience, but was was kind of brought in really classical. Spirit is gold. Oh. So, yeah. So, I think that would be my advice to myself. Just be afraid. Yeah. And I still do say to myself very often, like, you know, just do it. Dare to do things. Yeah. I think that, I think that, I, yeah, I think that's that I would say. So, I think that's, that's the amazing thing when you see someone like Jacob Collier. He, he, obviously, his mum and, and, and the dad just let him, let him go. I mean, he had a, he had a, uh, no, like me, I think he was a choir boy, so he had that whole, that whole training. But then he just went with it, and at no point was that squashed. He, he was, uh, grow, he grew up in an environment where he was very stimulated to be completely free in his creative, you know, spirit. And he also came along with, I mean, I, I believe he opened a, a, a digital, a doll, digital audio workstation when he was ten. So and with his ears and his training, now he's doing incredible things. If you see the projects, there's like 600 tracks and then all it like, it's insane. I, I I know how difficult it is. I, I produce music and electronic music as well. I'm like, like my mind is blown completely. No, it's, I, it, I think that's really important. I mean, I, I think I was lucky from that point of view because my, my first teachers, when I started the piano, were not at all dogmatic I, they just let me run and when i when we moved when i was eight to york because for the railway because my, my dad was on the rail so we moved it's a big railway town so we moved to this 
little village just outside York. And I was so lucky. I went to the village schools. I wasn't even in the city. But the piano teacher that I had there was just, she just let me go. And she, she suggested that I went and had, took an audition for the choir. And it was great. She was really open and just let me try stuff. And it was only when I got to the music school and I, the teacher I had there for the first two, three years was... No, that, that wasn't, that was another, that's another story. Um, was, was not really, he didn't get me. He didn't, he somehow just, I felt that, that, that being squashed. And, and then a few years later, I, I met another, I had another teacher who was fantastic. And he was the total opposite and really just re-inspired me to challenge things. He was into early music and, and in a good way. And, and so I started to, to re, reboot on, on doing stuff. But uh, I think that, that uh, sense of, of exploration and stimulation is so and that's one of the things we're doing with Alex is um we have our, our six-year-old is, is learning the piano and, and Alex is with her trying to teach uh, but how's that going it's but it's it's she has a quite she a strong character which makes it quite difficult so to resist like you know though sometimes we, I have a funny present from one of my students so it's a like thing you put Fingers. on your head <laughs> and it's like clothing your ears basically so, so and she using it like to put that she doesn't hear what i think <laughs> but like okay now i don't want to so she pretends that she doesn't hear well but but she definitely hears that we do it because when the practice of course yeah. she's really listening to how we do it and we do like because we play lots of ornaments, ornaments when we're doing something again something so she started playing putting ornaments in I so see. without me saying uh, yeah <laughs> And of course, I, we, of yeah. course, we let her do that yeah. because you know it's 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 nice to see role. that yeah. she, she's trying because she just why well, you do it or I play with her one hand so she plays another one and and I do add something and say oh, okay so I can do it well like, yeah so she tries she she really reacts to it very quickly so that's I didn't have at all so now you have this Beethoven project and you're um, probably finishing twenty seven you say we should have recorded everything hopefully by the beginning of twenty six. Yeah. So that we can get everything ready for release is, into the Is there anything that you would like to highlight upcoming besides the Beethoven? Any concerts or performances? And uh, are you are you working on anything else besides the Beethoven project currently? The Christmas CD, and if we have a French program, uh, which we're playing in the Bosendorfer series in the Valsekerk, oh, yeah. uh next in February. April was it Fe Fe February? February. Yeah. Um, so that's nice to do. We're, we're doing Debussy and and, and uh, Ravel and for Foray. But the Beethoven's taking a lot of, a lot of work. I mean, they're, I, they're, I they're really so. they're, they're big pieces. So that, that's that's the sort of core of what we're doing over the next. But we do still play lots of Mozart and Christian Bach yeah. program. Yeah. We do it in Belgium and, and on the Danube, uh, in Vienna, next next year as well. Um, yeah, we have a um, concert in Namur, the new hall. With the with the straight strong, they have a, they've bought a new straight strong instrument there. So we'll be doing all bird the program, so which will be in November. So, but that's hopefully all will be on our uh, newly built website, which I think it's going to be launched on first of October. That's will be duoplayer dot com. Uh, this, yeah, we hope so. Yeah, it's we're, we're with uh, Floor van der Holst Artist Management, so she's uh, we're setting it. We're setting it. All the new. So people can follow you there and yeah. for the yeah, so updates. It, it, yeah. It's from 1st of October, it should be okay. more visible for... Well, for so. We finally got into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in a good way. <laughs> oh, I want to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's a pleasure. It's been a thank wonderful you. conversation. Thank and, you, so. Uh, I wish you so much luck uh, with the whole projects, especially Beethoven and all your other endeavors, of course. Well, it's been wonderful to to be involved with with this project, especially with with Chris and the Mana Piano's involvement. It's it's been just a godsend because it's such a you know, great to have that support and and have all these toys to play with. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic! So yes, looking forward to all right. getting this. Thank all you. the best. Thank and you, Slav. See you Thank hopefully you. another time. Yeah, session. see you soon. All Thank right. you. So this is from the same. This is the, an edition from the same year as the piano, 1836. Well, this is what we use because there, there are no modern. I mean, there are no modern editions of it, and they're they, they're fantastic editions. They sometimes got mistakes in them, but they're, they're really clear. <laughs>